These dioramas of walkers, buildings, automechas, and creatures tell the episodic stories of a technologically advanced planet crippled by a mysterious fungal infection. That planet is Aegis. Today we're traveling from the sky market of the great Aegean Sea to the Lumber Isles, an atoll controlled by the Bellamy family that bristles with trees harvested for their lumber. You'll see this build come together from the early concept stage all the way to the build, and you won't want to miss the story at the end. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. For a while now, my audience has been clamoring for a collaboration between myself and some of the crafting heavies here on YouTube, specifically Boilai Hobby Time. So a few months back, I reached out with the idea and was surprised when he said yes. Since we're both doing world-building diorama projects with sci-fi elements, you'd think it'd be easy to settle on a theme, but due to the sheer volume of builds he's done, it took a while to eventually settle on Lumber Mill. And while that may seem rather mundane for a theme, I've come to realize that I'm fascinated by the more pedestrian aspects of fictional worlds. For example, while most people watch Star Wars for the Jedi or the Bounty Hunters, I honestly got the biggest kick out of just seeing a toilet in the Mandalorian ship. To me, it's these tiny thoughtful details that really breathe life into a universe. What do the inhabitants eat? What's the language and culture like? And where do they poop? So on the subject of making logs, I was happy with our lumber-centric theme. However, since I just assembled a building in my previous video, I decided to make this mill mobile. By the way, Boilai Hobby Time and I also reached out to Bill Making Stuff to join this collab, but unfortunately, he'd already made one. Still, Boilai's take on this theme is unsurprisingly awesome, so check his build out next. Once all the pencil lines were down, I cleaned off my workbench, then got to the inking stage. I used brush pens for the main outlines and heavier shapes, and felt tip nubs for everything else. I found the results unexpectedly adequate, and that felt pretty good. For the watercolors, I first painted all the rubber boot joints with a cool gray. I then chose various reds for the mecha body, which I thought would contrast well with any greenery in the final diorama. And since this terrifying machine is meant to be sulking through the woods, mowing down trees, you'd probably want it pretty visible. And so, with the concept firmly established, it was time to get building. In my concept sketch, the head was based on this Nerf gun, and since I've dissected my fair share of them, I wasn't anticipating the challenge this one would present but where there's a drill, there's a way, so I brute forced my way in. Admittedly, cutting straight lines into irregularly shaped forms is a challenge, but I found it helpful using tape as a guide. Then came yet more rotary cutting to get a few more details in the head. Since I'm left-handed, I've also started wearing a glove on my right hand because I'm fond of my fingers, and my only means of getting around my office is the moonwalk. I used a lot of epoxy putty for smooth transitions between hard edges. This putty dries in a few hours at air temperature and is useful for joining parts together. Next came this fuel tank, courtesy of a fuel tank. Now, up to this point, a lot of my Gundam bits, which I purchased secondhand online, were stored in cumbersome bins. To reduce time raking through plastic rubble, I got some divider cases and began sorting by general shape and size. This way, when I'm looking for a round piece, roughly 1.5 centimeters in diameter, I don't have to play Where's Waldo through 20 plus tubs of similar looking trash. With everything neat and organized and the cured epoxy sanded down, I modified the fuel tank to fit snugly onto the head. I also added some insulation foam to the inside so that later gluing would be slightly less annoying. I added a few more details to the head and the fuel tank, and hey, there's a 1.5 centimeter hole. I wonder where I could find something to plug it with. All right.
One method that really helped with the construction of this build was an armature made from a tiny block of wood and armature wire. Not only did it better help me to clearly envision the final form, but it also made balancing and stabilizing the figure much easier. With the hip joints in place, it was onto fleshing out the body, which mostly meant finding the right shapes to fit together to hide the wooden core. This is always the most tedious part of a complex kit bash project because the possibilities are overwhelming and it's easy to second guess every decision. But what I've learned is that the best option is the one that keeps momentum on the project going, and that even subpar build decisions can usually be fixed or transformed later on. Now, I would have preferred using only things I had on hand for this build, but unfortunately there was nothing of the approximate shape and size for legs that I needed that I had multiples of. This is one of the challenges of kit bashing a mech in particular. You need doubles of practically everything. You'll see me fake this a few times out of necessity later on, but for the most part, I tried making the two halves as symmetrical as possible. By the way, these toy guns were purchased from the Dollar Tree and were an absolute joy to work with. As with the fuel tank, I added XPS foam to the interiors so that the armature wire later added would be secure and strong. And it was around this time I received a package from Timu. Timu contacted me a few weeks ago offering to sponsor a video, but I explained I wanted to actually use their services first. I'm a big fan of AliExpress, one of their main competitors, but I have to say that after this first purchase, I haven't used AliExpress again, and Timu's selling point for me is the amazing ship times, competitive prices, and wide range of products. Amazingly, some of the orders I've since placed have even arrived faster than Amazon orders. So, if you're looking to cut costs and don't want to wait a month or more for overseas shipping, be sure to click on the link in the comment area to download Timu. And if you're a new user, use this code to get 50% off. Detailing the thighs went much the same as the body, though the advantage I now had of being able to perform very precise cuts with minimal damage to the surrounding plastic, thanks to this jeweler saw, was huge. Also, to give the thighs more dimension, I drilled out these holes which were implied by the original gun design. Another new technique I discovered was using a wire brush to scuff up all of the plastic. I usually scuff with sandpaper to help the paint and superglue adhere better to the surface, but a wire brush was able to get into much smaller spaces, and was quicker. I think that sometimes this hobby can be a little daunting to newcomers, because it seems so reliant on access to specialized tools, supplies, and a proper workstation. And while these are all super helpful to streamline the process, the fact is that you can get away with the bare minimum for a while, at least until you determine if this is a hobby you want to stick with. As an example, I built this floodwalker about a year and a half ago, but with a fraction of the tools I have now. I still really like the concept though, so I'm thrilled to bring the design to a new medium with these gorgeous screen printed t-shirts. I collaborated with another artist for weeks to get the design just right, and I'm proud of the results. As always, I'm using soft, high quality inks to print my shirts so that they don't feel thick and rubbery against the skin. I've also listened to your suggestions and printed a whole line of posters, plus some new stickers. So check out gamebuilds.com while the shelves are still stocked. I had a surprisingly difficult time finding the right base form for the lower legs, but eventually I settled on these tic-tac containers. I marked the cut with some tape, then made the cut with a miter saw, instantly making the room smell like a candy store. The labels were removed and the plastic cleaned with some goo gone, and as with everything else, some foam was glued in for rigidity and a mounting point for the armature wire later. A ton of cutting and shaping was still needed after that step, but eventually it was ready for hot gluing to some pre-fitted styrene plastic. Overhangs were sanded down, and then the armature wire was added for posing. I really like this method of building mechs. It can be so tricky getting the poses just right. The form and weight distribution is constantly changing, and it's nearly impossible to plan all the details in advance. But by keeping the joints flexible until the very end, you give yourself a lot of wiggle room to work with.
Model tank treads were used quite a bit on the mech, first on the shins, then on the backs of the knees. Motorcycle parts also came in super handy for adding bulk and visual interest to the cabs. During this build stage, I spent a lot of time finding pieces that would mimic organic musculature, particularly that of a bipedal dinosaur. I thought that using these forms would result in a final design that was easier on the eyes, as the parts would harken back to comfortably familiar shapes. Another consideration for this build was in creating strong, durable joints that would have the auxiliary benefit of making structural sense. The feet were one of the trickier parts of the mech to build, simply because I didn't have enough similar pieces to create each of the toes, so I had to get creative. I played around a lot here with actual Gundam model feet, which connected perfectly with the legs, but the result looked awkwardly large, kind of like clown shoes. So it was back to the drawing board. In the end, I removed the middle toe completely, which looked a lot better. I then added some die-cast Y-wing parts, an option made possible again by my lovely new jeweler saw, and I also added these model ATST bits. Once the feet were attached, I added further details with these wire paper clips, bits of chipboard, and armature wire. Now, up until this point, I'd held off on some of the major details because I wasn't exactly sure about the orientation of certain parts, most notably the head and torso. In the end, the head was flipped upside down and rotated 180 degrees, and once that was decided on, I added the front-facing lenses, and the gluing tread inside the head for the logs to ride on. I went ahead and airbrushed the interior black here, since there would be no way to get to it later. And then it was all covered up with a TIE Fighter wing and a Gundam skirt. Nailing down the orientation of the head helped to decide on the orientation of the torso, which was also rotated. A single 2mm armature wire became the connection point to the head and was wrapped in aluminum foil and then a thick layer of epoxy sculpt. This two-part epoxy helped to really solidify the joints, and the clay-like consistency made it easy to mold with sculpting tools and water. And with the putty still soft, I was able to attach some of the joints, like the hips. The arms were by far the easiest bits of the build, as most of the parts were vanilla Gundam pieces, with some tiny Final Faction toy additions. But as with a lot of other appendages, I was careful not to lock in any of the positions just yet, as I needed to carefully pose them first. The next step was to prime everything. I used to just use regular outdoor spray paint for this, but I highly recommend using a spray brand meant for models, as it applies much finer, dries faster, and leaves a perfect texture for painting later. But before that could happen, I attached the thighs and lower legs, temporarily mounted them to the foam base, then sculpted the faux rubber boot joints, again with epoxy sculpt. And to give these joints a bit more interest and hint at the hidden machinery within, I added these rotors, aka tank wheels, and finally stuck in some armature wire for the knee guards. Now, my blender skills are nowhere near good enough to sculpt a human figure from scratch, but fortunately, I was able to find this soldier STL on Thingiverse from Jim Jim Jimmy Jim. After deleting the unwanted meshes, I created an armature and named all of the individual bones. Typically, armature is used for animation, but it's also a great way to change the pose of pre-existing 3D models, which is what I did here. This was a tedious process, which involved manually linking different parts of the mesh to each bone, but once everything was set, it made posing a breeze. Of course, the mesh gets pretty ugly when you're stretching and skewing like this, so I had to later go back in sculpting mode to smooth some of the features out. I then imported this Gatling gun STL, made a bunch of modifications, added some handles to the front and back, and got everything positioned just right. I also added a mask and a hard hat, and voila, I had a 4-inch lumberjack. As with the rest of the plastic bits in this build, I scuffed the 3D figure up with a wire brush, which also helped to get rid of some of the print lines. 
Epoxy Sculpt was then used to fill in some of the misprinted areas, like this gap in the sleeve. And then, I sculpted in some extra details like the man's belt. Finally, some holes were added into the boots, and paper clips were super glued in, for mounting to the base later. After marking the position of the mech feet and human figure, I traced out the general shape I wanted for the base, then trimmed it out with a hot wire cutter. I then drilled holes for the trees I'd soon build. To complicate matters, I also wanted my lumberjack to be using a beam saw, which is a particle accelerator technology used to cut down trees on this planet. That meant I needed to hide some wiring for the LED filament in the tree trunk. The other end of this wire had to be hidden in the saw itself, so I fed some electrical wire through and hid the back end in this silicone tubing, which will serve as a cable powering the device in the fiction of the diorama. The tiny hole in the middle of the tube allowed the electrical wire to sneak out of the bottom and through the base into the electrical circuit, which I built on the underside by sketching everything out, then using a wire cutter prong to carve a series of trenches into the foam. The battery was added, and everything was soldered together. To give the terrain more dimension, I also added this rocky outcropping. I then mixed up some plaster of Paris and used my rock mold to make a bunch of rocks. I then made some lumpy texture paste with plaster, water, and some scraps from my paper shredder. This also served as a nice way to keep the rocks in place, though I really should have added some glue into the mix as well. My previous attempt at pine trees left a lot to be desired, so I tried a new technique here, which I got from Geordie Crafts. I first carved and roughed up some pine dowels, then drilled a ton of holes in them, spacing them out a bit farther as I worked my way to the bottom. I then stuck two strips of wire into my drill, sandwiched a bunch of unraveled twine between the wires, then added the tree, then more twine, and finally wound the wires together for a very convincing pine branch result. To finish it all off, I trimmed the excess wire, then added a bit of hair wax to keep the twine in place. Finally, I gave it all a haircut. And with the exhaustive four-week building process finally complete, it was time to move on to the painting and the short story. Please note, that this story happens decades before any of my other stories set on Aegis. Evidence Sample 09822-1 The following was taken from an intercepted employee log. I'm logging this entry from Sakani, the Grand Forest Isle. I know what you're thinking. How swell. A lush green island, sandy beaches, beautiful women. I must be in paradise. Yeah, no. On this island... I got black gravel shorelines as far as the eye can see, littered with debris washed in by oil slick waves. And as for the climate, you can forget swimwear and sunbathing. It's rarely above six degrees in the woods where our campsite is, and even colder out near the coast. Of course, I reckon you could still swim if you don't mind a touch of hypothermia and tetanus. But I'm not here for a holiday, I'm here to work. I landed a seasonal contract as a beam saw lumberjack for the Balami Lumber Corps. I won't complain about the pay. They dole out 100 ings per 10 ton of usable lumber. And if I put in a full 12 hour day, I can sometimes manage half of that before I'm tired enough to fall asleep standing up. The job is straightforward and doesn't require a lot of interaction with people, which is why I took it. My day goes like this. I'm in my boots at dawn, have a quick bowl of whatever mystery breakfast is coagulating on the burners in the mess hall, then I'm on site in another 30 minutes. It's just me, my beam saw, 
spare batteries, and of course the giant crust bucket they call a sajot, lumber mecca. As stupid and as slow as these things are, I also couldn't do my job without one of them. They hold the trees steady as us logheads hack them down at the base with our beam saws. They shove whatever's usable into their gaping saw hole mouths and produce, you guessed it, lumber. When I first got here, I wondered why they didn't just automate this entire process by mounting beam cutters directly to the mecha's arms. But then I remembered that a four-ton tree-eating machine stampeding through the underbrush shooting lasers from its wrists is possibly the worst idea ever conceived. These machines are dangerous enough as is. They don't pile the planks up as they produce them. That's part of our job. Instead, the planks fly out the back of the Sajot's head in a rapid-fire barrage of wooden missiles. Let your mind wander while on the job, and you might find yourself in a sudden game of try not to get impaled. That's why we're all wearing enough armor plating to start picking up signals from the Satlink. But that's not even the worst of it. All that stuff I knew about when I signed up. What they didn't tell me was that there's some kind of fungus growing on the west end of the island. The Lumber Authority won't answer any of our questions about it, and the official line is that it's just some rare fungal species only found on this island, but some of the workers here apparently have gotten sick from breathing in the spores, and a few of the old timers swear that one, it wasn't here when they first arrived years ago, and two, it's spreading rapidly. At base camp, they've got this giant map of the island, with a dotted red line cutting off the left side. Anything within that line is referred to ominously as the Blight Zone, and it's mandatory to mask up if you're working there. Now, it's uncomfortable enough lugging around all my equipment in heavy chafing armor, but adding a sweaty respirator into the mix is even less appealing than going for a dip in the freezing oil cesspool they call an ocean. However, they're offering bonus pay to anyone willing to work in the Blight Zone. The arborists tell us that for whatever reason, the trees in that area are growing twice as fast as normal, and the trunks are thicker and hardier too. That means rare high-end lumber that'll no doubt end up as some royal snot's recliner or bookshelf. So, I think I'm going to sign up for a shift. I won't be alone. One of the workers that ferried in with me, Zarn, is signing up too. So at least I'll have some company out there. Evidence Sample 09822-2 I don't feel so good. They weren't lying about the trees within the zone. They're at least twice as tall as the average tree on the rest of the island, and the wood they're made out of is far denser than anything I've come across so far. On a normal shift, my beam saw can cut through a half day's worth of trees before I have to switch battery units. In the zone, it's a third of that. I have to run the beam at full power for a good five minutes to make a through cut, and by then the whole saw starts overheating so bad I can feel it through my armor. The wood's a lot heavier, too. I wore myself out just stacking the planks and had to break long before noon to catch my breath. That isn't like me. Also, wearing the mask is unbearable. I kept it on as long as I could, but once the inspector completed his rounds in the morning, I ripped the thing off. I'd have suffocated had I kept it on. I caught Zarn with his mask off, too. At first, we just sort of stared at each other, like two confused animals, then had a good laugh about the whole thing. Our secret now, I guess. Zarn's a good guy. I think the reaction some of the men have had to the spores must be some kind of allergy. I feel fine. It's everywhere, too. Some areas are coated in such a thick layer of blight that it looks like, I don't know, some alien planet. All right, that's enough for today. My head is spinning with exhaustion. I gotta check out.
I'm off to bed. Evidence sample 09822-3. I'm beginning to wonder if the bonus pay is worth it. Sure, it's 25% more than the non-zone work, but I feel I'm only half as effective as usual, and my gear is about the same. I make so many trips back and forth to our supply camp to switch out batteries that sometimes I feel like a third of my time is just spent walking. And if I'm walking, I'm not cutting, and that means I'm not earning. Then again, the lumber is a lot heavier, so I hit my five-ton quota with a lot less wood. I guess it's paying off, but I'm wondering what kind of invisible toll this has taken. Something about the fungus, which most of the men are calling the blight, is unsettling. That's the best I can describe it. When I'm around a heavily infected area, it, it almost feels, well, this is going to sound crazy, but it doesn't feel like just a fungus or a plant. I feel like like it's watching me. <laughs> Jeez, just saying that makes me roll my eyes. I need to get in bed. Evidence sample 09822-4. Zarn's gone. I got no idea what happened to him. One minute he and his side jolt were clipping along just south of us. I'd hear the occasional buzz of his mecca as it chewed timbers and then nothing. Silence. I didn't think anything of it at first, figured he was just taking a break is all. But after an hour of hearing just silence, I walked over to check on him. His mecca was just standing there, engine still running, gaping stupidly at the ground as always. But Zarn was nowhere to be found. I searched for him myself until late in the afternoon, I didn't want to call in the disappearance at camp because any search and rescue parties sent out get deducted from our pay, but finally I gave in as the sun was beginning to set. What happened next was real weird. Some guys I've never seen before sat me down and asked me all these questions. What I'd seen, what I'd heard, if Zarn had been wearing his mask, had he been acting strangely, that sort of thing. I answered everything as honest as I could, well, except the mask bit. I didn't want to get him in trouble in case he shows up. <sighs> in case he shows up, listen to me, talking like he's already a lost cause. My head is spinning. I need a drink. In the morning, when I get up, I wish that we could stop and take each day in the evening when I get home always hope to find you all alone and out of harm's way every time I look around I hope to find you looking back at me you're everything I ever hope to see Thank you all so much for watching, and to Boylai Hobby Time for joining me on this collab. Don't forget to watch his creation here, and check out GamyBuilds.com for some cool Blight-centric merch. Until next time, this is Gamy Builds. over and out. <laughs>